Okay, so speaking of derivatives, so uh, as we've covered, we've I think we've transitioned from a healthy spot-driven market to a speculative leverage-driven market. So we're going to be spending a lot more time looking at derivatives moving forward. Um, On-chain and spot still have a very important role, um, but derivatives is what's going to create that near-term vol. Now, uh, open interest is just mooning, right? 77 almost billion. So this is actually higher than when I wrote the report and I only refreshed the data like two minutes ago. Um, so we're going to see that uh, open interest is just continuing to climb in futures markets. And the one that I actually wanted to highlight here, there's a few ways we can think about different exchanges, um, you know, just how we think about open interest and futures. Um, I generally will bucket them out to like crypto native, and then you've got the CME as kind of the poster child for institutional. Now, CME is the biggest by open interest, 16.8 billion, um, bigger than Binance at 12.6. And here is probably the most interesting thing. This red curve didn't really exist for a long time. Suddenly, Hyperliquid is 8.3 billion, has flipped uh, by a bit, which used to be the third biggest. Now, Hyperliquid is the third biggest. Kind of interesting. 8 billion versus 8.2, 8.3. Now, I don't understand a great deal about Hyperliquid. All I know is that it's a on-chain native perp dex. Um, the simple way I would think about this, I can't see Mr. Buttoned Up Goldman Sachs trader uh, playing around on Hyperliquid. Maybe in his spare time, but probably not while he's sitting at his desk. So I would generally say that this is showing us that we have crypto native leverage. Um, that can be hedge funds. Like there are crypto native hedge funds and trading desks and all the rest of it. They're speculators, you know, they're kind of early adopters, people who are willing to go out there and trade on a new, you know, on-chain perp decks. Uh, that kind of makes sense. So look, the, the real takeaway here, we have speculative interest. No matter which way we want to slice it, we are now in a, I, I think volatility is going to explode. So really the core takeaway here, we've got speculators, we've got degenerates, and we've got volatility is highly likely to come in and it's going to be fueled by leverage. Hold that second thought there on volatility because the options market doesn't quite believe it. Now, if we look at uh, liquidations, we had a really nice short squeeze here. Um, so short liquidations absolutely dominated in terms of total volume. Uh, if we go back here, we saw on the rally higher in October, November. That was the last time we had this much short dominance on the rally up to the ETF all time high, spotting a pattern. Um, rallying up into the ETF launch. Uh, yeah, I think it was the launch when they're announcing it and BlackRock's on live. And then the start of this bull. So I would say one, two, three, four different or five different times we've hit such a high amount of shorts in the market. Generally, the market goes up. Uh, so again, imagine being short. Um, Godspeed to folks who think that hit now is a good time to be short. It actually doesn't even matter. If the market goes into a bear market right now, I think you're insane to be short. Just I can't, I cannot see how anybody can think it's a great idea to be max levered short right here. I just look at the chart. I mean, I'd be, I'd, I'm out. I'm done. Even if it goes into a bear market, I'm happy to be wrong in that case. Like, uh, just, yeah, it's crazy. And speaking of shorts now, um, I actually think this is probably the last time I'll have to refer to this because my my base case, uh, my base case is that this um, uh, long liquidation volume down here that you kind of have to squint to see, <laughs> Good luck to these guys. I think these folks uh, are about to get squeezed. I mean, this takes up to 120K. I can see a move very quickly from where we are now to 120. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I think when it goes, it's just going to straight through it. And uh, we'll see short liquidations blow up. It'll be a little bit like we saw back here. All right, they're kind of short it. One guy's casket, one guy's stop loss becomes another guy's stop loss and, zip, and then away it goes. So I suspect that's how this plays out. Um, uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not too concerned about like a big leverage washout. Um, what would cause me to look at this and go, oh, it's probably a double top. If we had this giant yellow cluster literally on the other side of the price, then I'd be like, mm, not so good. Uh, the way it stands and the way that we certainly bounced off that short-term cost basis and then just straight back up to 109, um, I think the, bear, the bears are not in control. The bulls are in control and uh, good luck to these folks. Okay, so I mentioned volatility. So uh, we looked at in Imagine being short the futures side and the uh, options side. And my general takeaway there is that there's a lot of speculative and short-sided open interest in futures, which we just looked at. In the options market, they were very hedged for downside. And generally speaking, options are a more sophisticated instrument. This is not always true. There's gonna be speculators, but generally speaking, we're gonna have a more sophisticated audience. You know, you kind of understand how markets work to be playing around in options. Um, certainly surviving in options, probably the better term. 
Now, if we look at the volatility premium that options are pricing in 31%, I mean, you've got to go back to some really, really quiet times. After FTX, like this was, and, and for those who've been watching the newsletter for a little while, you'll actually recall all these events. This period here, I remember writing about it at Glassnode, the, the price went sideways over Christmas for two weeks within like a $520 band, like just dead flat, stablecoin mode. Absolutely nothing happened. It's like it is the flattest period of any price action ever um, on a percent basis, just completely dead. And options were pricing. I mean, what happened after that doesn't matter in direction. We no longer went stablecoin mode. So I think the takeaway here, it looks like we've got a short squeeze that's just rocket fuel for the upside in futures. In the options world, stablecoin mode. Here in uh, August, we're at 29K. We insta sold down to 26, high volatility flash event, and then we went dead for a period of time. Volatility came right down, and of course, we were on the cusp of a ripping bull. Um, and where we are at the moment, the short story is when the volatility is being priced to be Bitcoin is now a stable coin, it's coming. It, we are ready to move. This thing is going to pop at some point in time. And uh, when it does, I think it's going to be aggressive. And if I just look at all these different components, what's the path of least resistance? Straight through all those shorts. Now, the put to call ratio. So um, because we're looking at this as a ratio, this is how much open interest is in put options, which is downside protection versus call options, upside protection. Because we have puts in the numerator, the higher this is, the more the market is hedged for downside. Now, kind of counterintuitively, Look at when most people are buying downside protection at the arse end of a bear market. So when, when the house is a smoldering ruin and there's fire everywhere, people go, oh man, I need to go get some fire insurance. Very, very common. Um, and likewise, when the market is ripping to the upside, what do people say? It's not quite this, as easy of an analogy on the, on the call side. People are saying, I want some speculative levered long 100x you know, type returns. I'm going to go and buy some call options when the market's ripping. Of course, the right time to be going levered long call options is actually when it's the scariest and vice versa. When there's, you know, when it's all happy days, markets just trending higher and you know it doesn't look like there's any risk anywhere, that's usually when fire insurance is the cheapest. Now, I would say that you know, we've seen a pullback in put to call ratio. I believe this is because the June contracts, we had a lot of people, and again, I think that the market is fairly hedged for downside. We still have a fair amount of people. This feels more sophisticated to me because, again, if you're a speculator, you buy fire insurance on your smoldering ruins. If you're a smart money, you're buying put insurance when the markets could go down and you want to hedge some risk. Now, there's all sorts of things like tariff roll-offs and all sorts of stuff in June, July. I, honestly, I tried asking Grok. Even it doesn't know when these tariffs are going to roll on or off. It's a complete circus. Um, I stopped trying to ask it. So the key point here, I think this pullback here is just part of, you know, I think options expired and there was a lot of puts in June, but we're still much higher. There's still a whole lot more put insurance. Um, so I'm actually not too concerned. Again, path of least resistance. If we go down, the smart money are going to go, okay, cool, I was hedged. If we go up, they're going to go, oh, great, I didn't need my fire insurance. House is not on fire. Happy days, can't be concerned. So my base case is that we want to go higher and I think it's going to be explosive when it does. And I find it fascinating that the, the options market's just not pricing in volatility. And every time it's done this, vol's coming back. 